Hi. Um, so before I get into this this lecture, I want to apologize for having misspoken towards the end of the um, previous lecture, where I think I said um, perhaps the actor playing the fool um, may also have been playing Cordelia, and that is a viable possibility. Um, but I think somewhere in that little blurb, I accidentally said Lear when I meant the fool. So to be clear, many of the arguments made for why the fool disappears in the middle of the play, and of course Cordelia returns around the same time, is that, uh, or that, um, the actor playing the fool also played Cordelia, so they both couldn't be on stage at the same time, so the fool is kind of dis dismissed. Um, in which case, the fool, arguably, is of similar age at least to Cordelia, otherwise it would be completely bizarre, right, on stage. Um, so in that case, did I just say Lear again? I mean, the guy playing, or the actor playing the fool um, and playing Cordelia would have had to have similar age on stage, right? Um, which suggests that the fool is pretty young. Uh, it's possible, right? Uh, and that would be quite radical, I think, to see a very young fool. Um, but it's also equally possible, if not more so, to consider that the fool is an older man, closer in years to Lear and Kent than to Cordelia. So that's something which I wanted to clarify. I probably have made it more confusing. I apologize um, if I have done so, but it was. it is an interesting thing to consider the age of the fool. Just like one has to wonder how old is Festy. Festy seems old enough to have seen the world a few times over, right? Um, what about Bottom? What about Park? The Fools have a very interesting uh, possibility in ageing, right? They could be they could be younger than what their years let on. They could be older than what their years let on. Anyway, no more about that gap, although it's a very interesting one to consider if you are interested in, say, thinking about your final project, the guidelines of which will go up today. And I'll talk about in class tomorrow in conjunction with your presentation. Um, more on that later. For now, let us think about the daughters. Uh, let's start with the bad daughters, if you will. Um, so, at the very end of Act 1, Scene 1, right, after Lear has had his meltdown, his first meltdown, has banished Kent, has it uh, banished Cordelia, has given her nothing, uh, has practically disowned her and has revealed a sort of eccentricity, if not madness, right, uh, creeping into his being. Um, at the very end of that, after Franz and Cordelia have exited, um, this is Act 1, Scene 1, around well, the very end of the scene. I'm not going to say the lines because, I mean, line numbers because um, I don't have the Norton edition in front of me. I'm using uh, the Pelican, which is a different um, pagination, of course, but also might have different line numbers. So I'm not going to give you the line numbers, but it is towards the absolute end of Act 1, Scene 1, um, where Goneril says, Sister, it is not little I have to say of what most nearly appertains to us both. I think our father will hence tonight. Uh, that's most certain, says Regan, and with you. Next month with us. To which Gonwell says, You see how full of changes his age is? The observation we have made of it had not been little. He always loved our sister most. And with what poor judgment he had now cast her off appears too grossly. To which Regan responds, "'Tis the infirmity of his age, yet he hath ever but slenderly known himself." And, you know, if you like underlining, that is a line I wanted us to underline in class, but 
you may concentrate on it if you want now as you think about your quiz and as you think about the play overall. Um, Tis the infirmity of his age, yet he hath ever but slenderly known himself. Goneril says, the best and soundest of his time hath been but rash. Then must we look from his age to receive not alone the imperfections of long engraft condition, but therewithal the unruly waywardness that infirm and choleric years bring with them. Reagan says, such unconstant stars are we like to have from him as this of Kent's banishment. There is further compliment of leave-taking between France and him. Pray you, let us hit together. If our father carry authority with such disposition as he bears, the last surrender of his will but offend us. Of his will but offend us. We shall further think on it. We must do something. And in the heat, which means we better get on it, right? To act on, act on what we confer. Um, and conclude. This is a very important set of lines spoken by Goneril and Reagan in private, right? We are privy to them. Uh, it's a dialogue, not monologue. Um, but they tell us something, and Reagan's lines especially are interesting and important for us to consider. Um, her sister, her older sister, Goneril, is still thinking, well, the Guy's old and his age is really showing. He's catching up. Um, he's nuts. He loved Kent. He loved, oh my God, he loved Cordelia always. She was his pet and look what happened, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and she refers to it as poor judgment. Even she, right? Um, greedy, if you want to call her that, uh, as she might have been, uh, to you know, pick up whatever her father throws her way, uh, even she recognizes how horrible of a mistake um, it is to disown Cordelia. Right? And in response to <clears throat> Goneril's proposition that this is all a symptom of his aging, feeble brain, Reagan says, yeah, but he's always been like this, right? He's always been rash. He's always had poor judgment. He's always been careless or reckless. Um, think back to Hamlet Senior. Is this what we are, is this what we're hearing about kings? That does the power get to their heads? Does, does that make them crazy? Is it, is it the fact that he has to be both parent and king uh, without any sort of filial um, or marital support. Is that what is happening? Um, where, you know, the burden of that dual weight uh, renders him mad? But Reagan's point must not be forgotten. Like she is like any child who suffers abuse, uh, to think once historically or strategically, uh, ahistorically, to, to think of any child that suffers abuse, um, Reagan and Goneril too, um, are extremely alert to their father's emotions to their father's moods because his moods have direct effect on them on their life on their health on their well-being um so they are perhaps better readers of Lear than the others who surround him cordelia included because cordelia is the first to prompt his madness right to to kind of um speak the truth to him um in a manner that taunts him right and and he does think of it almost like a joke the very first time 
Cordelia says, I have nothing to say, right? She's like, nothing, my lord. And he's like, what? Um, right? He's got this, I can't believe this. She must be kidding, right? Um, and that, that moment, that exchange reveals that neither of them really is prepared for what the other is going to do. Um, that surprise with which one encounters the other reveals itself in the immediacy um, of their responses, right? The knee-jerk responses that they offer to one another suggest that they are not prepared to see uh, see each other for who they are or have become. Whereas with Goneril and Reagan, they have been in the peripheries, on the margins perhaps, of parental affection um, and have, they seem to be in very regular habit of picking up the morsels after uh, Lear, right? Picking up the morsels even after Cordelia because they jump to their performative, loving daughter's mode immediately, on demand, in a way, and, and, we, and we discuss this in class, in a way that Cordelia simply has never had to do, and therefore cannot do. Um, so, Gunwell and Reagan are quintessential, quintessential survivors of parental abuse, right? And like abused children, they recognize the direction in which their father's headed, that shit's going to hit the fan like it has in the past, only now, because he's older, because he's lost even the more basic elements of his sense, um, his the shit that he's going to throw and hit that's going to hit the fan is going to be pretty radical. So let's act quickly. We, let's talk about this quickly, right? So they are in absolute understanding of what Lear can do. Um, and I think that's very important for us to not only understand, but also articulate. Right, uh, because when Goneril speaks of her dis disappointment and her her impatience um, with Lear and his retinue, it's not coming out of nowhere. It's not that the power has suddenly gotten to her head. Uh, maybe the, maybe the power has gotten to her head a little bit, uh, but she has she is more likely emulating other powerful people, very specifically her father, who has always had power in his head, who's always let power get to him, right? Which is why Reagan's lines, he's always been rash. He's always been this way. We shouldn't be entirely surprised. It's just a little more of the same, right? Um, or a little more extreme version of the same. Uh, that is important. If the daughters are rash, are cruel, are thoughtless or unkind. They have, if they have become power crazed, they have done so almost in the quiet tutelage, accidental tutelage of their father, right? So when um, next we see the encounter between father and daughter, between Lear and Goneril, it is when she is disgusted with the knights, with the misbehavior, with the mistreatment of her own staff and retinue, right? Um, so we'll look at that scene and go into what, what Lear is doing with his powerful language, right, of abuse and cursing um, of his daughters. So we'll look at that in just a tiny bit. Okay.